Thank you. Thank you very much. In March of this year, there was a wedding in Durham, North Carolina. And like most weddings, it had brides, it had grooms, it had flowers, tuxedos, beautiful dresses, it had receptions. Unlike most weddings, it had 1,600 brides and grooms, and they weren't marrying each other. They were marrying the city of Durham. In what was called the largest civic union in history, these 1,600 people stood up in front of their peers and their friends, and they pledged their love and fealty to the city of Durham. And their pledge included uh, promises to uh, keep the streets clean and safe, to buy local, to support local arts and culture, to protect the environment, and to vote responsibly. Uh, what was also unique about this was it was not done by the city. It was done by a bunch of people who came together and said, really, we love this city. What are we going to do? And someone came up with the idea, let's have a wedding. Uh, they decided to raise a little bit of money for charity, and they set a fairly modest goal of about $12,000, and they more than doubled that and raised over $25,000. Around this same time, Mayor Dave Bing of Detroit receives a tweet, says, hey, Mayor, how come there's not a RoboCop statue in Detroit? <laughs> to which the mayor, who's on social media, politely but rather tersely replies, thank you, but there are no plans for a RoboCop statue in Detroit. <laughs> Too late. The idea was out there. And within a matter of hours, Detroit is buzzing about this idea. It's like, why don't we have a statue of RoboCop in Detroit? And so a Facebook group uh, forms within a matter of hours. And all of a sudden now, people are saying, we're going to build a RoboCop statue. And instead of going to the city or to the Arts Council, they say, no, no, no. We're going to fund it ourselves. And they start this Kickstarter campaign. And within a matter of days, despite what the local press called irony run amok, um, <laughs> they raised over $67,000 to build this statue. And it's actually going to happen. It's pretty amazing. Now, what do those two stories have in common? Well, they start with people who are emotionally engaged with their city, people who love their city, and people who want to do something above and beyond ordinary citizenship and maybe do something extra extraordinary for their city. Now, we'd like to think that that's actually a fairly common notion, but it turns out it's actually not. When Gallup, in conjunction with the Knight Foundation, conducted their 2008 to 2010 Soul of the Community Survey, which is basically taking the temperature of our relationships uh, with our cities. And they found out that that relationship is actually not very good. 40% of people said that they were unattached to their cities, 36% say they're uh, neutral, and just 24%, less than one quarter of us, say that we are attached to our cities. Now, attachment is not love. Attachment says maybe you voted, you're part of the neighborhood watch, and you volunteer once a year. Congratulations, you're attached. It doesn't feel very warm and fuzzy, uh, you know. But uh, what was also interesting is at the same time, Gallup was looking at economic data. And what they found was very interesting. The cities that had the highest levels of emotional engagement, uh, passion, and loyalty also had the highest levels of local GDP and economic vitality. Now, they were not going to go so far as to say these were causal, but they were clearly one of those interesting statistics that moved together. And we pay attention to those statistics that move together. Now, the fact that love matters shouldn't surprise us. When children are loved, they thrive. So too with pets, plants, and objects. And I do mean objects. And let's take, for instance, the car, because almost all of us have some sort of relationship, mostly a love-hate relationship, with a car, right? Um, and this car maybe is sort of indicative of, of that relationship. It, we, it gets us from point A to point B. You know, we do the maintenance occasionally. We wash it sometimes. And we treat it like a tool. It gets us from point A to point B. And we have this very functional relationship with it. And I think many of us probably have a very functional relationship with our city. But think about the car. We all know somebody who loves cars, right? They're the ones who are out there on the weekends waxing it with a diaper. They change the oil even if they haven't driven it an inch. And they love that car. And it shows. That car looks and feels very different from the car you and I drive. It's because they have invested some of their emotional identity, some of themselves, some of their love into that object. Now, don't you think if we invested more of our love and our identity and, and our emotional uh, side into our communities that they would not shine like that car? I believe they would. I've been asking the question, what do people love and hate about their cities for a long time now? And what's really interesting is the commonality of some answers and then the wild diversity of others. The commonality is people are pretty clear about what they hate about cities. <laughs> it's big things. It's things like traffic. It's things like parking. It's things like a bad education system, bad design. And big, intractable problems that you could spend a ton of money trying to fix. And even if you fix them, I'm not sure that creates a whole lot of love. And nothing represents this more than the pothole. We all hate potholes, no doubt about it. We all probably have a, a particular pothole on our way to and from work that we all have this sort of very much of a hate relationship with. The thing is, is we complain to our city leaders about the potholes, and they think that what we really want from them is to fill more potholes. I can guarantee you this. You could fill every pothole in Iowa City, and when asked, people would say, well, the streets don't suck quite so bad. <laughs> Sorry, you get no love 
for filling the potholes. There is very little emotional return on investment for doing things like that. Because the things that we love about places are small things, intimate things. Uh, things like a particular view, a great little uh, park, a place where you sit and watch people, a place where you walk your dog. Personal things. And I liken these things to that handwritten note that goes with the card or excuse me, goes with the gift. And gentlemen, we've all had this experience at one point in our lives when we forget to give the card to our significant other. We learn very quickly that that card really does matter. Um, it says something. It says we have this emotional connection to it, and we've taken a moment, and we've made it personal. We've made it intimate, and we've made it important in that sense. So I have this idea that love notes, these small things that have an outsized impact on the way we feel about people, also have an impact on the way we feel about places. And I have some examples here for you. If you've not been back to New York City in the last couple of years, uh, go back and check out Times Square. It's an amazing difference since they've made it into, into a pedestrian-friendly area. Now, in the past, when you went to New York, you went to Times Square, and it's this sensory overload, right? It's the place where you ultimately just wanted to look around. But if you did, you know, you step one foot off the curb, you're going to get run over by a cab. And if you stayed on the sidewalk, you were going to get run over by a New Yorker. Now they've actually fixed that, because you can actually go and do what you really wanted to do, which was actually look around. They brought in chairs. They brought in Wi-Fi. And in a daring move to close off the busiest intersection in one of the busiest cities in the world and make it into a pedestrian-friendly zone, and it's wonderful. It totally changes the way you feel about New York, because now all of a sudden it doesn't feel quite as overwhelming. It has that moment, and that's a love note. And while you're there, you should probably check out Highline Park. Highline Park is this elevated railway in the meatpacking district of Manhattan. It's about a mile long, and for 30 years it was, it was empty. They couldn't figure out what the heck to do with it. So they, eventually they decided to make it into this above-ground park. And you wouldn't think that being two stories above the city would totally change the way you feel about and experience the city, but it absolutely does. It's magical. You're walking up there. You're amongst these weird grasses and trees, hundreds if not thousands of other people, and it's an incredible example of a small thing that changes the way you think about the city. Millennium Park in Chicago is a big love note. It's a big, giant love note. Uh, but Millennium Park illustrates something very, very important about this. It illustrates the importance of play. How many of you have been, had that experience of going to Millennium Park? And tell me if you did this. You approach the bean, which is what it's colloquially known there. Of course, it's actually called Cloudgate. But all good public art eventually gets a nickname, right? So you approach the bean. You find yourself. You take your picture. You take your friend's picture. You take this skyline picture. You see kids lying underneath of it taking their picture because it's like this giant sort of funhouse mirror. And then right next to it, you have these two towers that have these video faces on them. And they move. And then during the warm months, they actually you know, have this, these water cannons. And it creates this above ground pool. Play. Think about how important play is in the context of our personal relationships. Those moments that we have with our friends and family that are unstructured, unplanned play, those are the bedrock of our, of our deep emotional relationships. We need to find more ways to play with our city. This is the Tampa Museum of Art. This is pretty new. It just opened within the last year or so. And I love the museum. It's fantastic. Great you know, architecture, great collection, really cool. But there's a couple elements that I think are even maybe more important than the museum itself. That's the dog park that's out back on the river and the playground that's out front uh, of it. Now, I know the, the museum has to be there to anchor that. But in the grand scheme of things, I think those, that dog park and that uh, playground actually humanize that museum in a way that you wouldn't otherwise think. Now, as high-minded as we'd all like to think of ourselves, like, oh, of course, I always go to the museum, right? Well, how often do we really go in and experience that? You know, maybe when friends come into town, where there's a great, there's a great exhibit. But people on a, on a near daily basis are getting use out of that dog park and that playground. And I'm sure at some point they said, do we really need that dog park? And isn't that playground really just a lawsuit waiting to happen? Well, fortunately, they said, no. Those are two important elements that add to the, the, to the, the importance of that museum and, in fact, elevate that museum even more in, in the sense of making it more human. This is the Saturday morning market in downtown St. Petersburg, where I live. And in, like many places, you know, lots of places have you know, a farmer's market. And it, you don't think of farmer's markets as being sort of really important, but they really are. I like to say that this is where St. Petersburg goes to meet itself. And on a typical Saturday, there'll be 10,000 people who come down there, 120 vendors, people with kids, their dogs. Uh, the former mayor used to come and play his guitar uh, down there. And I think that was a pretty good move politically. And you don't think, again, as these things as being important, but they really are, because these are the things that attach us to our places. Now, I have a few more things that make cities lovable. Um, any of you have kids or grandkids? You know, dinosaurs make things lovable. 
They do. And this happens to be the, uh, the Children's Museum in Indianapolis, and it's a part of their outdoor facade. And there's multiple dinosaurs that are all around there. And it's wonderful. And it's just sort of this simple expression of fun and things like that. But if you can figure out how to add dinosaurs pretty much to anything, I think yeah, that's a winner. <laughs> Rituals and traditions make for lovable cities. And this is uh, Providence, Rhode Island. This is Water Fire. Uh, it was started about 15 years ago by an artist by the name of Barnaby Evans. And they anchored these braziers in the river that runs through downtown uh, Providence. And they put cords of pine wood in it, and they light them on fire. It's water and fire. It's the most basic thing in the world, and it's absolutely magical. When you go there, uh, it's, it's happening. You hear the crackle of the wood. You smell the pine smoke. It creates these great sort of dancing shadows because the light is moving. Magic. Think about how many times we've had the experience of sitting in front of a, of a campfire or a bonfire. We're mesmerized by this stuff. Now imagine taking that to a municipal level, and you have the idea of what water fire actually is. And a few years ago, I had the opportunity to participate in what they call a lighting ceremony. And like the villagers out of a Frankenstein movie, we carry these torches <laughs> from, you know, from City Hall down to the river. We place them in this big urn. And from this urn, they actually light uh, all of water fire. And this has become central to the identity of that city. And if you're a tourist, you want to go to Providence, you want to go when water fire is happening. Zombie walks. <laughs> Folks, you know what a zombie walk is? It's a, yeah, it's a, for those of you who don't, you know, not everybody, not everybody's as cool as these guys. Um, it's this really slow moving parade, uh, brains. <laughs> and people dress up and they sort of shamble through town. And really good zombie walks have like designated victims as well. You know? So I might be dressed very normally, except I've got maybe goat entrails stuffed in my shirt. And the zombies descend upon me amidst much screaming, guts, blood, things. You know, fun. Um, <laughs> not everybody. But zombie walks in Pittsburgh go like this, hand in hand, because of a movie called Night of the Living Dead by George Romero. 1968, George Romero, who is from uh, Pittsburgh, creates this classic movie. And a few years later, he does Dawn of the Dead, which is filmed in Monroeville Mall, just outside of Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh has become zombie mecca. And this is really cool, because this particular thing came from uh, the Pittsburgh Downtown Partnership. They said, look, we recognize this is, you know, this is central to our identity. We're going to make this part and parcel of what we do. I think that's pretty cool. A bike-friendly city is a lovable city. Of course, for the obvious reasons of being you know, good for the environment, good for our people, fun, things like that. It says something even more important. If you're a bike-friendly city, it says it's not just about the car. Think about how much of our decision-making around our cities happens uh, around the car. It seems to be made by the car. If you're a bike-friendly city, it says, you know what? There's room for something else, and there's room for a different way of thinking here. That's an important message that people do connect with. People do realize that. Similarly, a walkable city is a lovable city for very similar reasons to the bike, but also walking allows you to do two important things. It allows for improvisation and discovery. Because think about this. When you're driving down the street and you see something new, a new shop, new restaurant, whatnot, do you stop? Chances are no. Uh, you maybe log it in the back of your mind, hey, i got to come back and check that out. But yeah, maybe you don't. But when you're walking, it's like, hey, this is new. Let me check this out. Or I've never been in here before. I wonder what's down this street. And how wonderful is it to discover something new about a city that maybe you've lived in all your life? Or discovering something new about an old friend. You know, say, hey, I didn't know you were a trapeze artist in college. Me too. <laughs> and that's, that, again, when we discover something, we feel like we're on the inside of something. So a walkable city allows for discovery in a way that other things don't. A dog-friendly city is a lovable city. And with apologies to cat owners, bird owners, fish, snakes, ferrets, and all that stuff, the reality is, is we just don't walk our cats. <laughs> and if we did, people look at us very, very funny. When we walk our dogs, we're creating something that's kind of unique. We're creating what developers and city officials and all people want uh, to have happen, says we're creating vitality on the street, a sense of something that's happening, right? Because you've always got to go out and walk the dog. Um, so when you're out there, you see other people, and they're walking their dogs, it's creating this sort of sense, hey, there's something going on here. By the way, there's a couple other really great things that happen when people are walking dogs. You have this sort of negotiated social capital that happens when a dog is in the mix. You know, you're, if you're walking two people past each other, they go, hey, hey, we're in the Midwest, maybe it's a little friendlier than that. But you know, for the most part, uh, it's, it's kind of, eh. But if there's a dog in the mix, you look at the dog, you look at the owner, the dog wags his tail, you smile at the dog, you, you talk to the owner, maybe there's something going on there. It just creates a slightly different feel, and that's social capital. And by the way, in an era where we can't afford more police, more surveillance equipment and things like that, uh, the dog walkers create a sense of safety. Not because this, you know, not because the little puggle is going to be a killer, you know, guard <laughs> dog, but because there's simply more people out there and eyes on the street. And what Jane Jacobs, the great urbanist, said, when we feel safe is when we see, we sense the eyes of strangers on the street. 
because there's nothing worse than going, walking down uh, a perfectly empty street. We've all felt that. But ultimately, the element that makes for the most lovable cities are the people themselves who are in love with the city. The ones who are those living embodiments of a love note. They're the ones who, who started Mary Durham. They're the ones behind RoboCop in Detroit. And they're exemplified by my friend here. This is Bob Devin Jones, uh, who's a creative director uh, of a small black box theater in downtown St. Petersburg, where I live. And Bob is the quintessential co-creator in the sense that everything he does seems to have an outsized impact on the city. Yet he does not show up on any traditional org chart you know, for the city. Um, but clearly, Bob is one of these central connectors that makes St. Petersburg a great place to live. And I bet all of you know somebody in your own community that's like Bob. It's like, man, if we lost that person, think about all of the stuff that we would lose. It's not just that one person, but all of that great stuff that they produce, the way they feel about the place, and the way that's it's infectious. You know, when somebody really loves a place, we sense that, and we feel better about that place. Bob is like that. And the thing that's interesting is that Bob is like the best spices that goes in making a great dish. And I know you don't actually need a lot of those great spices, and I know this because Wikipedia tells me so. <laughs> and not for the reasons that you think. Most every one of us here has probably used Wikipedia, right? But very few of us have probably ever made a Wikipedia entry. And in fact, statistics show that less than 1% of all of the users of Wikipedia have ever made an entry for Wikipedia. Less than 1%. They, it's what uh, uh, statisticians call a power law distribution and uh, sociologists call a, 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 a participation inequality, which is a fancy way of saying that there's a very small number of people who do all the work and the rest of us sort of consume. And that's fine. Um, I believe that physical communities follow a very similar rule. And if we believe that, that 1% of the community actually really makes the content that is the community, I mean, let's face it, all of us consume our cities, right? And in return, you know, we obey the law, we pay our taxes, and we spend our money. But there's a small number of folks, and you probably know them, you guys probably are them, who are actually creating content for the city that the rest of us consume. And I think that if we actually looked at that, and we started to think about our economic development strategies and how we go about this, we might change some things. Let's think about this. If 1% is actually making the city, that means in Cedar Rapids, we've got about 126,000 people, and so that means there's about 1,200 folks. And here in Iowa City, 67,000 people, which means there's 670-odd folks who are really making the city, both officially and unofficially. What if we were to add just one-tenth of 1% 1 and take that number just up by 10%? 67 more content creators, people who are going to start businesses, people who are going to do extraordinary things, people who are going to love the city, people who are going to start TEDx's, things like that. Don't you think that would have an exponential impact on the quality of life that happens here in the city? I do. To me, this is the new math in talent attraction and retention, and it's something we need to think. We need to find more lovers for our cities. Because there's a gap. The gap between the city that we desire and the city that we can afford, and we feel it every day. Into this gap is going to step people who are emotionally engaged, the ones who love their city, the ones who give a damn. Think about that. We need more of those folks. Because when we love something, we go above and beyond. We do extraordinary things for it. We fight for it. And here in a place where Iowa is affected by the floods and many cities felt, you know, or many people felt like they might have lost their city, this is a powerful, powerful tool. Because I believe if we add the human heart to the conversation, if we add the human heart to our toolbox of community and economic development, that to me will prove to be the most powerful tool of all in creating not just livable cities, but creating lovable cities. Thank you very much.